Welcome to the joint webinar series between the Program of Church Management and the Global Institute of Church Management. Our topic today is recovering our mission, and we're going to be looking at the recent document from the Congregation for, um, from, for Clergy, kind of on parish structure and addressing the challenges of evangelization. As we know, the Pope has been very blunt about the challenges in the parishes. I mean, he's, you know, spoken very candidly about the parish secretary and how she can be a block to do evangelization in the parish. So this is a very, this has been an ongoing theme throughout his pontificate. I also think that his recent encyclical just uh, released on the fourth, Fratelli Tutti, that he, he emphasizes the, the spirit of encounter. And I think that um, all of us here, we're, we're coming to you to with our own personal experiences. So today our panel is most is based in the US. Um, and many of us have global experience, but you know, the US is kind of, we have our crazy situation right now, but globally there is a lack of, of living fraternity. And I think this has impacted the mission for evangelization. And in, in reflecting upon this, you know, there's a section in Fratelli Tutti where the Pope says that being able to, to live in openness and union with others is only possible by the charity that God infuses. And it made me stop and think that the Christian experience is unique because every other major religion up to the dawn of Christianity saw the, the, the other as a part. And instead, Christianity sees the other as neighbor. And this is precisely why evangelization has such a unique component. And the, the fact that this document underscores, that the Holy Father underscores that this is only possible with the infusion of charity. Uh, look around. I mean, this is unique to Christianity. And it's not to say that there aren't good things in other religions. There obviously are. There is truth in other religions. But what's unique to Christianity, there are many things that are unique to Christianity, but I think for the purpose of, of our conversation, it's this underlying understanding of seeing the other as our neighbor, as our brother, and that completely shifts things. And, it, and so it impacts our evangel it, what evangelization is. I, I mean, a, a question for another conversation would be, what is evangelization in, in other religions? And I've, partic I've attended some conferences and panels on this, and it's, it's fascinating. But evangelization, I think, in some ways is uniquely, uniquely Christian. So today we're going to look at this com the, this topic, and um, this is just a, the first in our series, well, actually the second in our series of webinars this year on um, building a transparent and accountable church. And so with the Global Institute of Church Management and the Program of Church Management in Rome, we're looking to promote best practices um, in terms of management, but also in terms of evangelization and how this, how we reach the ordinary people, how we continue to promote the message of Christ. So we're going to have some formal parts of, of the training, which are, you know, management and accounting, but then there are other, the, the more pastoral elements. So today's, today's conversation is focused more on this pastoral. I want to remind you that we have two more webinars uh, about our next two webinars. November 12th will be the management lessons of St. Escriva, the founder of Opus Dei, and then December 10th is going to be particularly provocative. We will be talking about a standard for financial transparency in the church. So given all the current happenings, I think that that conversation is going to be particularly lively. So today I wanna to begin our conversation. I wanna welcome our participants. We have Michael Terrian. Uh, Michael and I actually were colleagues several years ago at the Augustine Institute. He is currently the president of the Preambula Group and I should have his website here. It's preambula.org, P-R-E-A-M-B-U-L-A.org. Um, so, and the, his organization is dedicated to the work of evangelization. So clearly he's the right person to have on this call. We also have Father Anthony Steppel, who is currently serving as the vice rector at St. Patrick's Seminary in Menlo Park, which is in uh, near San Francisco, California, hence the Golden Gate Bridge is his background there. He's rising above the, the morning fog. And 
Father Anthony has, has been in a parish. He's worked as vicar general for the Diocese of Tyler, Texas. He also taught uh, with the program of church management in Rome for a year and now serving as vice rector. He's had vast experience. So I welcome you both today. Thank you for your time and for your, for your expertise. For our, our audience, we will have, at the end, we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A. So feel free to put those questions. There's a QA um, icon at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to, to list your questions. If you're watching this after the fact and it's recorded, it's not live, feel free to contact us also with suggestions. We one of the challenges that I realized is that we're the Global Institute of Church Management. And so sometimes uh, our references are still very US centric. So I just ask for your patience and welcome your suggestions because we do really want to grow this to so that it is actually global and, and represents a lot of different perspectives. So the perspectives in the church, I mean, all of us, we have particular experiences and we're formed by this, the principles of the church. So for today, I wanna to start, I'll start with the quest, same question for both, um, for both of our panelists and they will give a brief response. We'll do three questions and then get to the question and answer. And again, I really encourage you to, to feel free to submit your questions, even if you think that uh, they're difficult, provocative, the, the more difficult and more provocative they are, the better the question I think it is. So the, to the first question, um, the instruction for, for the con from the congregation of clergy, it's a, it's a beautiful call to renovate the missionary calling of the Catholic Church and our in our parishes and in our diocese. However, um, the, and the document points out that parishes that do not follow the calling of evangelization, quote unquote, preserve a nostalgia of former times as opposed to seeing the future with courage. This is really, I, I think it's striking again, for, from my perspective, completely consistent with the language of Pope Francis. So, and the document goes on to describe kind of a lot of depressing situations. I'm sure we could all come up with a litany of depressing situations. And that's the easy part is figuring out the depressing part, the failure part. As, as is this situation common in our parishes? And if so, based on the experience of uh, each of your experiences, and if so, what are the causes of this? So I guess, Father Anthony, if I could turn to you first. Thank you, Pia. Um, I, I think the answer to this question of is it common or not depends upon where you are um, and the evangelical missionary entrepreneurial spirit that your local pastor, whether that's the priest or the bishop has. Indeed, the document wants to make very clear that ultimately we win by saving souls. We don't win by preserving whatever preserving or protecting institutional assets at the cost of saving souls, uh, but we win by saving souls. And so in this context, particularly in, in, in the idea of evangelization, we can look at the Western world, Western Europe, United States, Canada, where extraordinary structures have been built up most especially over the last 150, 175 years uh, this was really, really good. The Catholic school system, et cetera, these are models for the rest of the world to look at. Nonetheless, perhaps some of these things have been set in stone for so long that they're no longer useful uh, for our context today. And therefore, lots of things arise, but most especially comments, even in like the second paragraph of the document where you know, let's not, in a sense, hide behind canon law, but let's really look at canon law and see what canon law allows us to do within these structures. Just because we've been doing something this way for a long time doesn't mean we should always do it this way. Nonetheless, you know, for someone from a burgeoning area of Catholicism, various pockets in um, Africa, in Southeast Asia, um, you know, even South America that very much has a Catholic culture. When we speak to priests, religious bishops from those areas of the world, one of the things that they lament is the fact that they don't have the structures. 
they have people with extraordinary faith, uh, but oftentimes these people uh, become dispirited because there isn't any structure to take this further in any particular way uh, that, that, that leads towards something where it's very organized, um, it's not corrupt, we, we, we know where our money goes, uh, we, we don't concern ourselves too much with members of the clergy being involved closely with politicians or that clergy are uh, intertwined mostly with personal, um, their, their own personal benefit using the church, you know, purely for themselves and their family. And so those parts of the world uh, can learn from the experiences of the Western developed world what worked, what didn't, and then begin to apply that themselves looking at canon law and saying, well, just because they did this in the United States or just because they did this in Western Europe doesn't mean we have to do it exactly this way. We can learn from their experience and perhaps apply that to our own situation again, always with the goal of the salvation of souls. Thank you very much, Father Anthony. Uh, Michael. Yes. <clears throat> Well, I would agree. Uh, well said, Father Anthony. I would agree with everything that you've just shared. So just to sort of add to that. Um, in the West, obviously, my, my experience is limited to the United States, and I lived in Europe for a time, too. And I would say that Europe is a bit further ahead of where the United States is right now in terms of its historical trajectory. Um, I don't have any direct experience of the church in Africa or Asia, but I do, I, I can tell that there's tremendous vibrancy there. I think in, in looking at the experience in our context here in the United States and the West in general, um, if you go back historically, you know, we relied a great deal on institutions that were built, institutions that had a lot of political backing and a lot of monetary and economic support. And we say in Pittsburgh often that we're overbuilt. <laughs> and we're overbuilt because we were able to build largely in the United States because of massive amounts of immigration that created a burgeoning, massively growing population of American Catholics that were very faithful. And for various reasons, we've seen tremendous decline in those populations. Some are cultural, some are just uh, population has shrunk, moved. I mean, there's a whole lot of reasons. But what's become evident to me anyhow in my experience is that we really have to shift our paradigm from more of what I would call an institutional witness to a personal witness. And what I mean by that, I don't mean to disparage institutions after all, we, you know, we built an entire civilization with institutions and they can be incredibly effective and impactful. The, the problem is, is that if you think about it, an institution is reliant on a relatively small number of people who end up doing most of the heavy lifting when it comes to mission. So if you think of Paul's ecclesiology in 1 Corinthians 12, where you have an entire body that needs to be exercising its function in the body. And you have from Ephesians 4, this idea that the entire body has to be functioning in order for the church to attain maturity. We can never allow, as I think we have in the West, institutional witness to replace or substitute for personal witness. So the cause of decline, in my opinion, is we become accustomed and culturally conditioned to participating in a religious community without the requisite interior conversion and transformation of an individual life that is required for the full functioning of the body of Christ. Wherever we are, I think any culture I mean, if other churches and other places around the world became economically and politically supported in building institutions, they would eventually probably run the same course and encounter the same problems because it's always a temptation to rely 
on the strength of an institution rather than leaning into the interior transformation of each and every one of the members of the church who do the real work of mission and evangelization in the, in the world. Thank you, Michael. Um, so we, we've kind of touched on my second question, which was looking at the, so the second, the second section of the instruction is entitled from the conversion of people to a conversion of structures. And I, I want to kind of continue this conversation a, a bit Father Anthony, you made the point that you, you've introduced canon law. And one of the things that I frequently find is that people think that canon law is what about what you can't do. And in fact, I think that that's a very limited way of reading canon law, that canon law actually, there's there's a lot of potential there. And, and I tend to read canon law in terms of what you can do. Uh, and, and Michael, you brought up this concept of the personal witness. And so what we've come to, and I think this is a tension that the, that the document acknowledges in the second section, is that we have these institutions that are no longer, these institutional structures that aren't living because we haven't been living this personal witness. So again, I, I like that you kind of um, addressed that this is, that even in, in the developing countries where there might be a fervent faith, um, they could run the same course that we've run. And so I just want to take the conversation again to this, continue along this trajectory, how we've made our mistakes in the developed world. We know what they are. So one, how do we move forward? We've, we've started, both of you have touched upon that, but I want to develop that. A, how do we move forward? And B, what would you say to someone, again, let's help continue to explore this, learning from our mistakes. What do you say to someone that's in, um, in a dynamic faith community but lacks the structures that we have? How do they, you've got to integrate structures. We can't do this without the structures. So what is a, a healthy integration here? Uh, Michael, uh, go back to you. Well, I mean, that's just a huge question, but I think I'm going to land on this word, and that's culture, organizational culture. The power of the structures is less important than the health of the organization. And I think we have a lot, Catholic social teaching has wonderful principles for organizational healthy culture. So when you think about the principle of the common good, for example, and subsidiarity and solidarity, and even just justice, uh, different things like this. There's ways in which I think internally as we build structures and, and as we maintain them or, or, or support them, we always have to be converted <laughs> to our, our own principles. What we profess to the nations of the world we have to be converted to those principles internally and always be discerning and examining how well we live up to the standards of organizational culture that Christ himself through the church teaches us. So a very simple example, any leader in a church can lead uh, from their own personal prerogative and operate in a command and controlling way micromanaging all of the work, uh, worrying about political uh, um, issues of who gets to pull the levers in the organization and exercise influence. These, these are all things that any organization can fall prey to, but as Christian people, we have to be the first to be converted and say no to those temptations when we occupy positions of influence and authority within an organization. The second thing I would say is we always have to make sure that whatever we put in place by way of a system or a structure or a process um, or a, a program and organization is always, always in service of the mission. And we know that the mission is being served because it will bear the fruit for which the church exists, which is to make disciples. And so if we're busy doing a lot of things and we're not making disciples of, of other people, then that's a very, very good sign that we're not on mission and we've lost the sense of our identity as 
the particular kind of organization that we are, which is the church of God, the people of God called on mission to uh, bring the gospel, to make disciples of all nations. Thank you, Michael. Father Anthony. Yes, I, I, I sincerely appreciate how Michael um, you know, went back to foundational Catholic principles from Catholic social teaching uh, in, in his response. And so uh, because of that, I'll take it to a more practical level with my response. Um, with, with parishes in particular that perhaps feel dead, uh, they're not winning, it's not working. The Holy Father, the Congregation for Clergy gives this interesting metric, community of communities. So in, in many parishes all over the world, uh, we do the census and we count people as members or as families. And the Holy Father, the Congregation for Clergy is not asking us to stop doing that, but to start also thinking about how many communities do you have? It's not merely enough that someone is a member. It's not merely enough that a family is a member of a parish. We want them to have some sort of active and actual participation in the life of the parish because we understand once they have those types of experiences with other people in the parish, sharing their faith, participating in the sacramental life, growing in holiness, once, once that type of structural conversion takes place, then we have that personal conversion that takes place. Suddenly a member or a family does not feel alone, but feels that, okay, Maybe, maybe my parish is large, and so it's too much for me to feel like I'm, I'm part of something because it's so big, but at least I can be part of a small community of communities. And even within small parishes, there's going to be differences, differences of age, differences of gender, differences of race, differences of language, spirituality. Many, many factors can come together. Well, allow those people to come together and have these various faith experiences uh, whereby their faith is strengthened. They are uh, given the spiritual energy that they need, the spiritual courage uh, to, to go to other people in their local community, in the parish or even outside of the parish and say, come, let, let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. These types of things can take place uh, much more easily when it's a smaller group and not something that we're trying to bring about in a large way. Uh, you know, hopefully we can get into this um, um, with the, the structures at the diocesan level in the future question by you or some of the participants, but, you know, to vastly reconsider some of the ways in which the church traditionally and typically has done things in terms of that organizational structure, particularly in places where there aren't any. But at the parish level, at the parish level, the document is very clear. And the German bishops got very upset at the fact that the document makes very clear that the parish priest is the one who ultimately has charge of this. And too often today, priests just kind of throw their hands up and say, well, I'm just going to let it go. That's not what the father of the family does. Uh, he, he shepherds, he protects his sheep. And so um, the church is asking of them as shepherds of their particular flocks uh, to protect them. Uh, and one of the ways in which we do that in places where there's little to no organization is, is to help and assist in that. And being creative, precisely what Michael said, in a cultural way. Um, the culture in the West versus the East, the North versus the South, it's going to be different. And the church is not asking anyone to follow some sort of cookie cutter, particular way of doing things. You as the father, as pastor of the parish, here are some of the tools that you have. Here are some recommendations that we offer you to bring this about, not for your own good, but for the salvation of the souls of the people in your parish so that your parish is constantly on mission. Thank you, Father Anthony. I, I think both with the comments that you and Michael made, it, it reminded me too that, again, I started out at the beginning saying that, that um, Christianity is unique in how we see the other. We see the other's neighbor and brother. I think another unique element of Christianity is 
incredible amount of freedom within Christianity. I mean, we look at, for example, look at all the different religious communities out there, all the different spiritual traditions. They're very, very different, right? And that is because we have this, this ultimate, free, this, this amazing freedom. And there isn't, you know, a, I mean, setting aside media caricatures, there isn't a cookie cutter Christianity. There's incredible freedom in how you, you live it and how you express it. Uh, how you are nourished. I, I think of St. Augustine at the beginning of his document on Christian doctrine. He talks about the, the interpretations of scripture, right? And he says that there's a mountain and he says, there's, there's lots of different paths to the mountain, the, up the mountain. The, the important thing is you get to the top of the mountain, right? And he even talks about the different translation interpretations of scripture, as long as they're in accord with charity. So we have these principles that I think just really facilitate authentic diversity in the church. And so I guess what I, I take a lot of consolation in, in comments that both of you make, because I think that it means that Christianity really can be lived and applied in so many different and diverse ways and all of them authentic expressions of Christianity and authentic witnesses. I, I wanna shift just a little bit again, back to the document. So, and uh, Father Anthony, you, you touched on this, there's a the document it, there's an ongoing tension in the church about the role of the laity and the role of the clergy and ten, we tend to see them um, almost in opposition to each other rather than complementary and and working together we have um I, I would i think many of us would agree that in many parts of the world since vatican ii there's been a clericalization of the laity <laughs> and so I want to turn back to you both. How do we, how do we hammer out this relationship? How does, um, how does the pastor? How is he a leader and yet part of this team? How do the lay faithful assume leadership roles? And what's, how does leadership just, how is leadership different for the pastor and for the lay leaders? So uh, if I can go back to you, Father Anthony. Thank you. Um, you know, this the, the response to this is yeah to just to, to go back to Michael's point is going to be very culturally different from one place to the next but most importantly you know what the what the document presumes is that we have a good and holy priest who wishes to go about making his people holy and so uh, okay he's doing his thing now what um, so first and foremost for the pastor, he recognizes, okay, you know, particularly with the material aspects of the parish, this isn't his, this isn't his fiefdom. Um, he is sent by the bishop to serve this particular community for a time. Uh, the document makes clear that there's a preference that priests that are sent to parishes would be there for a long time, not what's grown so custom in certain parts of the world where priests are sent for a year or two, maybe three at the most, and then they're moved on. The priest never gets to actually be the father of the people. The people never actually get to see their priest as their father. Once the priest is there and he can begin to, to build up some of these communities within this community of community model, well, you know, he, like a father to his children, makes himself present to them, but you know, the father of children allows the children to live their lives and they do things, yet the father makes sure that he's present for them. Uh, he speaks to them from time to time. He gives them the attention, the affirmation, sometimes even the corrections that they need uh, in, in for their particular group. But just like a father of many children would not want his children to constantly be separated, he must also from time to time bring these communities together as a community of communities. Uh, you know, we, we have this in a very, very particular way in the Southern United States, but many of our African brothers and sisters understand this, where a parish will have five, six, sometimes 12 languages spoken. Uh, it's really, really difficult in that type of context because the first question we always ask is, what language are we going to celebrate Mass in on Sunday? 
Uh, and so, okay, we can we can un easily understand in these contexts, we can have these smaller communities, but then we use the liturgical patrimony of the church to bring these community of communities together to celebrate uh, in, in, in powerful ways. You know, a, a beautiful example that we have here at the seminary here at St. Patrick's, about a third of the student body is Filipino and about a third of the student body is Hispanic. So on the feast day of St. Lorenzo Ruiz, the big Filipino feast day, it is the Hispanic seminarians that carry the statue of St. Lorenzo Ruiz. But then on the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe, it is the Filipino seminarians who carry the statue of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so it makes sure that everyone is coming to these celebrations of great feast days. We're all participating. And by the end of it, I forget the fact that I'm an American or Filipino or Hispanic or whatever it is. I'm just so happy to be Catholic uh, because language, skin color, age, gender, background, none of these things divide us. Faith is the thing that, that, that unites us. Uh, I'll stop here just at the parish level, but hopefully we can talk more even at the diocesan level. Thank you, Father Anthony. I'm just gonna follow up with one quick thing. Um, so you talked about, you know, sometimes a father makes correction of, for his children, but as children grow and they become adults, sometimes the, the children make corrections. So I just want to, can you very quickly, I know it's a big, it's a huge question, but very quickly, that is a tension in a lot of parishes is how, do, how does a lay leader or lay person, you know, a parishioner correct the, the pastor and I mean, We've all seen examples of this. Some are good, some aren't so good. Can you just give a quick response to that? Because I want to, I think yes. some of our lay listeners might be interested in that. Absolutely. Scripture gives the path for this, that you know, we speak to the person privately. If if nothing happens, we bring a few witnesses. If that doesn't happen, well, then we go to the higher level and the higher level, eventually, you know, the church. And so concretely, for us, we would speak to the pastor, the priest, whoever that is. Um, and maybe it's not just one meeting, maybe it's two or three, just to try to, let's let's have a, uh, a spirit of collaboration to try to make sure that, you know, we we're, we're, we're understand we're all working on the same page here. Um, and then we can bring some witnesses, uh, other people into the group if that doesn't work well. This is where, as the document suggests, whether it's vicars for rain, deans, the local bishop, you know, auxiliary bishop, whatever it might be, vicar of clergy, someone else. Um, at, a, at a certain point, you know, we do our part. If there isn't any change that we would hope for, well, Lord, I did what I thought I was supposed to do. It didn't work out. Thy will be done. Uh, and then we persevere uh, in being faithful to the faith. Thank you. So, Michael, back to the, the this question of the leadership um, between the, the clergy and the laity. I look forward to your comments. Yeah, so um, I guess where I would begin my comments is just, you know, going back to Pope Benedict's call, you know, for the co-responsibility of the mission of the church. I think it's a it's really a rallying cry that we continue to discern and seek to understand the how. How do we do this? And I think we have to begin, first of all, with a clear distinction of roles uh, and the complementarity of roles. It's something that pervades our Catholic theology, um, whether it's between men and women and the complementarity of masculine and femininity. But we also, in the church, we have the complementarity of different roles and different areas of responsibility. Uh, Vatican II, of course, made it very clear that the primary purview of the laity is the sanctification of the world. And um, there was, there's been a tremendous call, but I think historically, one of the things that happened after Vatican II, and again, I'm just speaking to the context principally in the United States that I'm familiar with, is that there was what I call a backdraft into the sanctuary, meaning the universal call to holiness and the, the call of the laity somehow became reduced to serving in a functional capacity within the parish. So you, you've got those who might 
proclaim the word as a lectionary, or you might have someone who serves as a catechist. Uh, there are some paid roles for people within the parish. Now, and, and all of that's great. The problem is, is that there's very few roles in the parish. Most of the parishioners are, in fact, not going to satisfy those kinds of official capacities and responsibilities. So we have to ask the bigger question, how do we form and equip the, the parishioners to fulfill their mandate for this co-responsibility for the mission of the church? And in my experience, it's primarily about formation. We have to provide really deep and integral formation. And by formation, I mean all four you know, areas of formation that we typically associate with seminary or the formation of the clergy. All the people of God in some manner need that kind of integral formation. Now, ideally that would happen in the family. Um, but we also know the reality that many families are not they're not able to fulfill that responsibility to the extent to which I think the church imagines that happening. So the parish plays an indispensable and vital role of supporting parents in their role of providing that kind of integrated formation so that the people of God really mature in the faith and are able to go out and carry out that mission in the world. So that's what I would say on that side of things. Looking at within a parish or even within a diocesan structure, um, you know, again, we have to respect and honor the, the roles and responsibilities that are canonically defined. But the way in which, and this becomes a cultural question again, the way in which that collaboration unfolds is of enormous importance. And so there, there needs to be uh, mechanisms and systems and strategies in place for good communication, for good strategy and planning around how we're gonna fulfill the mission that we're called to as a parish community, given our context and the, and the nature of um, the diversity that we are experiencing and the needs that exist within our parish territory. How are those spiritual and temporal needs going to be fulfilled in terms of what we're going to do uh, as a as a community of faith, and and so again, there's going to be different roles, and there's got to be a healthy collaboration, and I and, and unfortunately, again, here in Pittsburgh, in which is I have you know I work for the diocese, you know I've worked in parishes, sometimes there can be tension, tension between between the the laity and the clergy, uh, sometimes. Um, you know, clergy, for example, wanting to, to micromanage everything. But on the other hand, you have lay people who think the parish is theirs and, and father doesn't seem to have a say sometimes. I've seen both scenarios. And both of those are just unhealthy ways of working together and collaborating. Um, we have to keep role clarity and distinction before us but we also have to keep the complementarity of our different gifts and, and uh, what we bring to the table. So if I'm in charge of a program or I'm in charge of a parish, I have to know where I'm strong and where I'm weak as a leader. And then I have to say, who do I need on my team around me to help complement? Uh, so we have a well-rounded team that can really get the job done and uh, fulfill the mandate and the mission that we as a parish have in our particular and unique situation. Thank you both. Um, I think before we get to the questions too, I want to ask you just a very quick question and to our participants, please feel free to um, to submit your questions at the Q, in the Q&A box and we'll answer them shortly. I just, in when we were promoting this webinar, we talked about the the movements and in the in the church, all the different movements. How have they impacted kind of evangel? How have they impacted evangelization, and how are they kind of facing the challenges that, that this document is addressing? Just to be either of you have any quick reflections. Thank you. Um, I, I had the great privilege of working in a parish in Spain about ten years ago that 
exuded the model that this particular document suggests of a community of communities. There were about 25 different charismatic communities of all different sizes there. Uh, and so the pastor and his parochial vicar were constantly going from one group to the next to the next, uh, edifying the people in their faith. And what, it, what that furthermore did is it edified the priest's faith uh, in that way. So mm -hmm. the happy thing with some of these you know, charismatic, you know, in, the, in the universal church sense, uh, communion and liberation, Opus Dei, um, various others, uh, th these, they already have structure to them and therefore it's, it's perhaps a little bit easier to be able to take something uh, that has been tested by time and in other places of the world. Uh, this is what they have done. This is what their founder suggested. Here's the way they do things. Here's their particular spirituality. At the same time, um, you know, maybe that doesn't work in the current context and therefore adjustments may need to be made uh, within that particular local parish. But the happy thing is that we see particularly with the support, um, you know, from Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, that you know, the, these communities do have something to offer the parish, um, whereby they engage the lay faithful, they engage the priests so that both the, the spiritual father and the lay faithful are placing their particular charisms and their gifts at the disposal of the parish in that proper hierarchy that Michael was addressing in the previous question. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think one of the most important things I think can be done is to allow these different um, movements and apostolates to live within the parish. Um, one of the death nails of parish life is trying to do everything and trying to uh, invent, reinvent the wheel or, you know, like I hear it a lot. Uh, we have to have our own version of something. Well, why? Like it, the parish has a fundamental role, which is to create, you know, the fundamental role, of course, is the sacramental life. You know, there's outreach, there's, 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 there's the formation of our people, but there are so many ways to do that. And if, if pastors can allow these movements to have a place in the parish to live, then so much good can be done instead of saying, no, I can't manage that. So I'm not, and this happens here a lot, like there's a no. People want to bring a, a, a different program or a different movement in, and the answer is no, because, because it's a lot to manage and it gets messy. But, you know, that's why you have a staff. Is, you know, the pastor has to keep his eye on the whole, on the big vision of things, and how these pieces fit and, and conduce to that vision. So it's his job to direct and guide, but he's got to create that space to let these movements live because they do a lot of the groundwork of that. And I see in the, in the questions that talk about interior formation, that's hard work. That's, it, it's time and human intensive. We, we need to have lots of people involved in providing those formative experiences and opportunities for our people so that's what I'd say. One of the greatest things a pastor can do is let those movements just exist and live. Meet with those leaders on a regular basis to make sure that, you know, everyone's on the same page, moving and rowing in the same direction. But then let them do what they do so beautifully and so well. Great. I want to turn to our questions and also be mindful. I think, Father Anthony, you have a hard stop right at the end of the hour. Okay. So I want to be as mindful as I can of time, uh, which is a personal challenge. But anyway, we have a question. One of the first questions is that in much of the developing world, the family is especially present as a powerful locus, uh, personal witness, but also as the fundamental structure. How can the family be more effectively empowered to carry out evangelization within and beyond itself? So I will toss that to whoever would like to take that one. It's a, I think it's a key question. Well, as a family man, I suppose I can go first. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. 
raising kids in the thick of it right now. Um, and I ask myself this question, what can the parish, how can the parish help us? Because we need help. It's, it's hard out there. The world is, is, you know, not supportive of the faith in so many ways. Um, so I, I, I think that, again, I come back to the issue of formation. Um, we can, as a church, tend to focus on the formation of the young. And again, coming back to our teaching, the parents are the primary teachers and formators of their parents. So actually, programmatically, we should put more energy and time into investing in forming parents, especially at the beginning of their marriage and family life journey, really investing in them. Because most of what a child is going to embrace and, and live in their adult life is going to be what they received in the home. That all the research tells us this. So regardless of cultural context, the, probably in my opinion, the number one thing that a parish can do is to really be intentional in investing in the formation of parents who can be can learn more and more how to form their children. And then part of that is identifying who are those mature couples who have raised families and done so with some degree of success, um, as we you know, with at least most of their children practicing the faith as adults. And Call those people to become mentors to young couples and walk with them in the first seven, 10 years of their married life until they get their feet and know how do we hand on the faith? How do we do this? It's an art. It's not a science. It's an art. And every family is a little different. Every child is different. And so the more we can invest and equip parents for that sacred role that they play, the better. And thank you, Michael. And I think I would add, like, concretely, I've often thought, you know, what does this look like? And I'd like to see our sacramental prep, for example, uh, teach parents how to be involved in the teaching of their children. Not you send the kids off to CCD or confirmation class or first communion class, but teach the parents to have this role. Uh, even with regards to things like sex education, I, I'm kind of stunned that even in Catholic schools, we are assuming this responsibility. I think we should be teaching the parents how to have these conversations. And to your point, every family is different and within every family, every child is different. And that's why I, this idea of the parents being the first educators is completely consistent with the church teaching on subsidiarity. And then it allows for, for all that flexibility that you need in working with individual families, individual situa children, situations, but I, I couldn't agree more. I think if we could equip the first, the parents to do this work and concretely, you know, all right, how do we teach the parents to teach their children in order to prepare them for the sacraments? So let me get back to the questions. Um, let's see, we have a question here. This is for Father Anthony. Father Anthony, you say that we presume that the priest wants to be holy, but what if that presumption isn't fully formed in the priest? So I just put you on the hot seat, Father. Yeah, it, the, the, the comment that, that I was making is that the document presumes that the priest um, is, is of, of uh, someone who searches for holiness. Um, so in, in this, you know, what if this isn't the case? What if my local parish priest seems mediocre, lukewarm type? Well, uh, then I think this document is a good response to that for the lay people. Um, come together in communities, just like Michael said, okay, families who really want to know how do I go about doing that art, of passing on the faith to my kids, they come together in a community. Uh, as they assist one another, as they support one another, in their own growth and holiness, okay? Perhaps they don't have the, the, the ideal families, perhaps their parish is dysfunctional, if you will, but their own growth and holiness, their own excitement over the faith is going to have an effect on the local pastor. 
and in time as he sees his own people saying we 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 want to come to mass we want to go to confession when the pastor begins to see those children uh you know receiving holy communion faithfully participating in mass knowing their catechism just as good sometimes better as the pastor then suddenly okay he he becomes energized by that uh, whereby his soul can be saved even by the lay faithful obviously this isn't the ideal this isn't the way it's supposed to be you know and, and dare i say I, I think most men, if not all of them, when they enter the seminary, they're on fire for God. But, you know, something happens along the way where it becomes routine. Um, you know, the, the, the scandals that, that surround them, they just, they lose heart, they lose energy. And so sometimes a little spark from even the lay faithful in their parish can be something uh, to turn them around. Uh, that's so powerful from the words of Christ, because then... If it's a lay faithful who's saving the soul of a priest, how great will that person's reward be at the last judgment? Thank you, uh, Michael. I want to direct a question towards you. You had mentioned four areas of formation. And so somebody asked, what are the four areas of formation used in seminaries that also apply to families and lay, men and lay members? Yeah, so um, starting with what's really the most important is spiritual formation. And that's really the formation of the interior life. And it's really the integrating piece, like without a prayer life, without a relationship and intimacy with the Lord, the other areas of our life are not gonna grow the way they need to. The second area would be what we would call human formation or just the formation of our personality and our character as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So we all have gifts and we all have faults and we need to develop those gifts and learn how to use them and be, I always say, show up every day as the person God calls me to be. Um, but I also need to be working on my faults and growing in virtue and holiness in conversation with the Lord and through the power of the spirit working in me. And then there, of course, is the intellectual formation, which is it's very important, especially today, that we know and understand our faith and can, to some degree, express it to other people, because it's hard to share your faith if you don't understand it and you aren't conversant in speaking. Obviously, scripture holds a pride of place of knowing the word of God, but also knowing the church's teaching and the catechism and other spiritual and theological writings. Um, and then the final area is pastoral formation, which I would call, uh, Pope Francis calls it apostolic formation. And I think that's more appropriate to the laity in general, which is we're, we're called to bear apostolic fruit in our life, to go forth and uh, to engage the world with our faith and um, to work towards the building up of the kingdom of God in the world, whether that's in our workplace, whether that's with our neighbors, at the soccer field or the football field, F-U-T, for those of you who are not American, um, you know, on the sidelines with our neighbors, uh, in those community spaces like cafes and, and uh, parks, you know, when we encounter people, we're called to share the gospel with other people. And so that's the other area of formation. We need formation and how to do that effectively, confidently, fruitfully, um, because so often we stop. We, we get maybe nervous and afraid to share our faith with other people. So those, those are the four areas that of formation. All right, and I try and I'm ambitious. I wanna see if we can get to two questions here um, before, before the end of the hour, but I think this is a fascinating question. What is the possibility of recovering the mission outside of the parochial context? And I have to say this question resonates with me because I've never, the parish has never been very foundational in my own personal formation. Um, so to, uh, I don't know who would like to take a shot at this question, but I think it's, you know, what is the possibility of recovering the mission outside of the parochial context? I'm happy to say a few words about this. I think the fact that like what, uh, Michael is doing with uh, Preambula and the Augustine Institute and all these other places is the attempt 
on on the part of lay faithful who are saying, you know, it's just not working within the structure of the institutional church. We're searching for something and we can't find it. And so lay people are stepping up and they're doing this great work. And what we see with this document is it's the Holy Father Congregation for Clergy ringing the bell saying, hey, you know, um, these these things are fine, but you know, let's let's also set up within the institutional church itself the place where these types of conversations and things can take place. Um, because we don't see members of the hierarchy priests doing these types of things, at least thanks be to God, there's a sufficient number of entrepreneurial lay people who are stepping forward to do this type of thing. Uh, not only for themselves, but for the people around them. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I credit our other guest, Michael, here as is, is being an example of someone who's doing that type of work. Thank you, Father Anthony. Yeah, oh, please, Michael, please. I just say, yeah, just a quick comment. I, I would say, you know, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily juxtapose the two. The strength of the mission is going to proceed from the strength of the inner life of the community, just like my external actions are going to be effective and fruitful to the extent to which they flow from the, 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 the strength of my interior life. So I think that, in a sense, we have to go within before we can go without, and we have to get that interior formation. So to the point about community, the stronger that parish community is, that parochial community is in Christ and in the spirit, the more fruitful it'll be out in the world. And um, what will probably be our last question here, this is really, I, I've seen this myself, I'm sure both of you have seen this. So our questioner says, my experience is that pastors bring persons who will conform and not challenge. Can you speak to the model Jesus used like the inner and outer circles and the tensions it generated much like what pastors use in the parish? And I think we see this at all levels where the, pe the people that are brought in, um, it, it's people that are going to, they're, they see this as kind of like, um, you know, this is, they're, it's kind of a, a formal role. They're a dignitary rather, and so they're not ready to challenge the pastor. Can either of you speak to this? I, I, I guess I'll jump in. <laughs> yeah, that's you, you Michael. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, it, one of the challenges I think that, you know, uh, let, me, let me strike a chord of sympathy with the position and the role of the pastor. Um, when, when you're in a leadership position, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll say this simply, it's easy for everybody to come to you and complain. <laughs> and very few people ask you how you're doing. So I think one of the most important things that we have to do is, is we have to, there have to be people that can build a, a circle of trust and confidence and care around our leaders. And not just the, the, the pastor, but any leader in ministry. Um, and, and, and the reason why is because when that, those bonds of trust exist, that's where we can be we can be honest and communicate truthfully with one another because we know that that individual or those individuals have our best interest at heart and are speaking to us in charity and helping us become aware of our blind spots and where you know we might need to grow. The other thing though is that when we are the leader in that position, we have to be willing to hear that feedback and have the humility to take those that feedback to prayer and ask the Lord to help us to grow. So if I'm a leader that shuts that conversation down or closes myself off to that kind of feedback, then that creates a kind of dynamic that can become very dysfunctional. So I don't know, did that? Yeah, I think that it's very helpful. And I, I, honestly, I think at the end of the day too, we just, all of us have to continue to approach this from a perspective of charity and our own interior lives are going to shape how this plays out. Um, somebody had asked in the question, and maybe Michael, you can answer this in the, in the Q&A, but what are those four principles or four uh, groups again that you were talking about? So if you can just type that in the Q&A, that would I, be helpful. I did, did it not show up? Oh, you did. 
Okay. I, I did that's, and I sent it, but I don't know. Maybe I didn't a, do it right. No, that's just slow on me. That's my, it's user error. So I want to thank you both for your time. I know Father Anthony needs to escape to go. I think you're going to teach class. Um, so thank you both for your time today. And as a reminder, Michael's website is preambula.org. That's also in the, I think it's the, it's been sent out on the chat. We'll try and publish that too when we publish the, the website, the webinar. I want to remind you that the series continues on November 12th. We will be having the management lessons of St. Escriva. So we'll be um, hearing from about three panelists, I think, that have worked fairly high up in Opus Dei and how, what are these practical management lessons. Then on December 10th, um, the stand, we'll be talking about a standard for financial transparency in the church. So again, given everything that's happening today, I think that's going to be a very lively conversation and I look forward to it. I thank you all for your participation. Uh, please, if you have any suggestions, comments, questions, feel free to contact us. We are looking to perfect this, um, this series as much as possible and we want it to meet the needs of as many people as possible. So again, thank you for, for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again on November 12th. Take care and God bless.